as above, so below. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Yeah, I'm a psychiatrist, still am. I see a few patients and uh, it's really fun. And I've got somebody coming in for coincidence counseling, which is a subspecialty I'm developing. People who are having trouble with uh, having too many coincidences. And I just had a little biopsy thing taken of my nose. It might be a little basal cell something or other, but we'll see. Um, Please uh, subscribe to our channel here. It really helps get us out there. And um, buy my book, because uh, I'm talking about it, it indirectly with everybody that is on this show, and you'll get a deeper understanding of meaningful coincidences should you look at it and study it a bit. The story I'm going to be telling uh, is is called celebrating my book launch uh the very book that's over my right shoulder i've been wanting to have a book um, book launch party here in charlottesville it looked like it was a conventional thing that people do uh and i wanted to get a little better known in town uh and so through a series of coincidences you wouldn't be surprised to know um a book party took place and Somebody at the book party told this story. Uh, I was having lunch with others in a park when a guy we didn't know came over to us with a wallet and a phone he had found in the park and asked if he should turn it over to the police. Why did he ask them? Okay, he could have or he couldn't have. He mentioned that the owner lived in Afton, <clears throat> where the speaker, the person telling the story, lived. So I asked to look at it uh, to see if I knew the person, and she did. He lives on the same road as I do. So she says I contacted his wife and said I'd bring it by. On my way, I stopped for some business at the bank, was delayed due to computer glitches, which placed my arriving at their house at the same time as he did, allowing me the opportunity to chat and to hand him his phone and his wallet. He was, as you might imagine, ecstatic. He called it a miracle. And uh, okay, it's, it all depends on who you are about how these coincidences happen. And for him, it definitely was a miracle. A miracle that she had found his wallet and phone and had and he and he had been desperately trying to figure out, well, just where did I leave it? He'd also been in the park for lunch where, she, where the speaker had done been so we, they were both amazed and in awe of the coincidence of this guy coming up to them with the wallet and the, and the phone and being on the same street as he. But then she told him that that evening she was going to a launch party for a coincidence book. And he said, Bernie's? <laughs> that was the fun part of it. Uh, I know him. He had an office in the same building uh, I, I once had. Uh, for my psychiatric practice before moving out of there. So that was a lot of fun. That still is fun thinking about it. A coincidence about a coincidence. And the nice thing, it was, was told at a book party about my book, which this guy knew I was writing and had published. So that was, uh, that. some coincidences are just a lot of fun, but it depends on who it is that uh, is the the center part of this and today we are going to meet ken bell uh and ken is a remarkable guy uh for the coincidence project uh, he's he'll tell you more about it but he has been a wonderful help for me and trying to get my ideas out and for the coincidence project itself he is a marketing executive designer and writer as a professional communicator for 30 years he's created everything from church newsletters to startup brands to national ad campaigns seen by millions you can tell maybe he might have something to offer the coincidence project and me he comes from new mexico 
south, southern New Mexico. You can almost throw a rock at the Rio Grande, I like to say. It's further away than that. He thrives in the desert and mountains, yet manages to survive in an urban setting for now, which is Houston, Texas. He writes on topics of personal growth, relationships, and spirituality on his blog called Reaching Awe. Dot com reaching all one word dot com when he's not writing you'll find him parenting listening to audiobooks or climbing colorado mountains he lives with his wife two daughters and stepson oh in dallas sorry in dallas texas i was in houston was a different story so welcome to the show <laughs> it's not like we haven't talked to each other before so welcome mm -hmm. to the show ken so so good to be doing this with you in a formal way well, thank you, Dr. Coincidence. It is uh, quite an honor to be here. I really appreciate you inviting me. Um, uh, you're, go ahead. And you, uh, I think you like to have your guests start out with telling a coincidence story. How did you know that, Ken? It's coincidental, I guess. It I've must have been intuition. To, yeah. I've also listened to a hundred or more of your podcasts. So <laughs> okay, well, that'll do it. <laughs> I kind of know the pattern. But I thought I'd start with my own story this morning, which I call uh, how, to, how I Met Dr. Coincidence. Uh, so about 10 years ago, I had a significant shift in my life. And uh, what happened is that amidst a series of tragedies, I had a sudden spiritual awakening that completely changed me. And in that moment, in that experience, I was briefly one with the universe. And I was in the state of complete awe and bliss. And in that moment, everything changed for me in my life. And I, I realized that many of the things I had thought or believed my whole life had really had turned out to be lies. And I was in, I was really looking in the wrong direction uh, in my life. And we'll talk more about that experience in a bit. But um, what that did was it started a spiritual journey for me. And so I started reading everything I could, could get my hands on about spirituality and coincidence and uh, consciousness and all those things. I was reading William James and Aldous Huxley and Carl Jung and Alan Watts and, and you name it. And uh, one of the things I started doing was studying the emotion of awe and how that emotion ties us to the divine because it, that, that feeling of awe was really the closest human emotion of what I had felt in that, that spiritual awakening and spiritual experience. And so one of the things I did was I set up a Google alert for the word awe and some related terms. And then, um, so I, I'd done that for a few years. And then this past January, I got an alert about an LA Times story. And that story just happened to be about a psychiatrist who was studying coincidences. And it, in, in the article, it told the story of how the psychiatrist had had this experience of waking up in the middle of the night choking, um, and then discovered that his father simultaneously was 3,000 miles away across this, the, the country was choking on his own blood and dying. And I thought, as I read that, I thought, wait a minute, I know that story. And yeah, it turns out I had read it in one of those many, many books I had read for the past uh, few years. And so through that, I found your podcast and uh, your blog. And I started looking at your podcast guests and I was like, wait a minute, I know him. I know him. I know her. I know <laughs> and it, you had this whole lineup. This is a cavalcade of people that I had been reading and following for the past few years. And so I felt this real call to, to dive deeper uh, with you and your, and your work. And so I reached out to you on your website and I really thought, you know, no one's going to read this email. No one's going to be interested in hearing from some random dude on the internet. Uh, but I said in that email, how can I help? I've got some marketing experience and background and maybe I can help like get this message to a wider audience and and you did respond and then connected me with some other people. And then I started doing some volunteer work for the Coincidence Project and for you, uh, trying to get this information to a wider audience. And through that, I got to know you, Dr. Coincidence. Um, and now, so here I am. So interesting coincidence, I think, because I'd heard your story in the past and then your story brought me back to you. And, you know, we, you know, I've talked about this a couple of times, but it felt a little bit like coming home it felt like, you know, finally some of these topics and concepts that I've been thinking about for, for decades now have a place to, to live and some people I can talk to about it. And uh, yeah, so it, it feels a little bit like a family. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the work you're doing. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, the, you, you remind me of another coincidence here. 
because the email you sent me was months after that LA Times uh, article came out. Uh, and it just happened that a couple of days before, the person who was doing the editing for the stories that people submit to the Coincidence Project website. And uh, if you have a story you want to get out there, you can go to, to the coincidenceproject.net and you can submit your story and Ken will be the editor of it. We had a, uh, the editor we had before just quit and we were just needed somebody. And three days later, there's, oh, can I help? <laughs> yes, sir. And your timing is just right. And, and it's important uh, for you to recognize audience that we are, that we can have needs and have them filled. And how that happens becomes a subject for another discussion. But Ken, in his need, filled our need. And it's key, key, I keep trying to get people to recognize what Rumi, the, the ancient poet, said that what you are seeking is also seeking you. What you are seeking is also seeking you. We were seeking Ken, and Ken was seeking us. And just how that works is uh, part of what I'm trying to be able to uh, suggest. The psychosphere is involved with it. So that, that's an important part of it. Now, Ken, one of the things that you mentioned uh, as we were talking earlier about not just you and your spiritual awakening, but you're, you're seeing something going on worldwide that's something like what you're experiencing. Could you tell us more about what you mean by that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll get to the story of the awakening and what led up to it in just a minute. But I, I really feel like the deeper I've, I've delved into these topics over the last few years, the more it seems like my awakening is connected to a lot of other things. And it makes me a little, I don't know, there's there's still a skeptical side of me, but I feel like um, there's, a, there's some sort of resonance happening, some sort of global, you call it the psychosphere, which I think is an apt term. Uh, but there's something that's a little bit like Carl Jung's collective unconscious, but it's now becoming more conscious. And all of us are realizing we can connect in all, all kinds of new ways through the internet, through social media, through instant information, and through groups like yours. And then people are starting to notice patterns of how we connect. Coincidences, I think, are one of those patterns. But the more we look at those and open ourselves to them and tune ourselves to them, I think the more... Uh, of a global, holistic, beautiful experience we can have of all like living as one collective organism instead of as separate individuals who are all, you know, fighting for our own ego and survival. And yes, uh, and I would, I would add to what you just said about our collective human organism functioning together while also having our own individual identities that keep evolving. And so the, CA, the, connect, the CHO, the collective human organism, evolves in part because individuals in it are also evolving. And so there's a reciprocal relationship uh, between the whole and the parts. Well, I like the, how you're smiling at that because it sounds right to you is what I'm guessing. And um, I thank you again for that. So we've got we've gotten to this uh, because we wanted to have other people hear about your spiritual awakening. And uh, if you don't mind my uh, giving a little prelude to it, there's a lot of strange things that happen in parking lots, ladies and gentlemen. And you will hear one of them. Just one of those things that I'm picking up now lately. But Ken, why don't you tell us how you got to your spiritual awakening yeah I, I certainly and there's a there's a lead up to this which involves a, a, a whole series of situations and, and tragedies that happen and then the awakening happened but i think in the in the aftermath of that i may have connected a few dots that i think might be helpful for other people and steps that were critical for me and i think other people can can learn from so i'll try to try to make those as succinct as i can but I had this, as a, as a kid, I had this tr tr pretty traditional upbringing. I was raised in a small town in the New Mexico desert. It was a Christian conservative family. Um, my grandfather was a Methodist minister. My mother was a 
devout Southern Baptist. Um, when I was four, I had this incident where I almost died. I, my mother was driving me home from the grocery store. I fell out of the back of the car going 40 miles an hour down the, the road. And I came face to face with the bumper of a Volkswagen Beetle, missed me by about six inches. Um, and uh, that might become a little bit relevant later as I, as I talk about what happened to my daughter. Um, but I had two much older brothers who were seven and nine years older than me. I was kind of a nerdy and shy kid. I was the kind of kid who you know, wrote poetry, was afraid to talk to girls. I was always a little bit anxious and depressed. And that was just something I've carried with me my whole life. Um, but what all of that means is I got left alone a lot. And it could get pretty lonely out there, out there in the desert. Um, but the good part of that is being alone gave me a lot of time to think. And I realized that that I was maybe wired a little bit differently than than some of my friends. My mom had told me when I was little that you know, I I would see people who weren't there, and in my playpen she would say I would say, "Mommy, who's that man in the corner?" Um, and she felt like that was significant. I don't know what that means specifically, but what I do know is that I was always interested in the the deeper meanings of life, and I was always kind of looking for what's going on beneath the surface and. I'd try to have these conversations with my friends and I'd say, I'd ask them questions like, well, if God made everything, then who made God? Um, and their response was always the same. It's like, who cares? Let's go ride bikes. So I never really got an outlet for those kind of things. And I always suspected that, you know, church wasn't really telling us the whole story. Um, but I grew up in the Methodist church and it was an open, comforting, you know, warm place to grow up. And there was no discussion of, fire and brimstone there, which was good because I already knew that there was no hell. Um, I just somehow knew that that God, the, the God I understood would not create a hell just to trick us into going there. Um, but uh, as a teen, um, growing up, I got involved in youth ministry and that was very, that was a, a great outlet for me for some of these spiritual topics. And eventually I was given some leadership positions and then one summer at camp, I had this literal mountaintop experience in the Sacramento Mountains where uh, we were sitting around the campfire and singing Pass It On and Kumbaya and those kind of things. And I felt like I was merged with the mountains and with the trees and with God and with the firelight. And I had this great feeling of oneness. And I just I, I felt like I got this message. you got to share this. Somehow find a way to share this beautiful feeling of oneness. And so eventually I decided I wanted to do youth ministry as a career. So I grew up, uh, married a girl I met in high school, and we had lots in common, a lot of fun, a lot of passion, except that we argued all the time. And so we kind of developed this really volatile relationship. But I had the, I'd had this belief since childhood that if I just follow the rules and create a plan for my life, um, everything will work out fine. So college, marriage, career, children, all I have to do is follow the steps and everything's going to work out perfectly. I called it the plan. I literally called it the plan. And so I, I see you laughing at that for some reason. Um, but uh, what happened was eventually I wound up as the youth minister for one of the largest and wealthiest churches in Texas. And I thought, well, there you go. The plan works. So everything's working out. Um, everything's going to be great in life. But then the cracks started to appear. And so it turned out uh, that this at this church, that this small town boy didn't really fit in with that big money culture that they had there. And I quickly got the idea or the feeling that this church cares a lot more about donations than they do about people. And so what happened was within, I think it was seven months, they fired me and they fired the my good friend I had hired to work with me there. And so that created this huge spiritual crisis with me. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm just, I'm done with my spiritual quest. And life went on. Um, I transitioned to a marketing job, uh, built my career there. We bought a house in the suburbs, my wife and I, and um, got a cat. We did all the things, you know, you do. And uh, all that was great, except that we were still fighting a lot. Something was just not right in our marriage. And we continued to have conflict and we continued to, uh, grow farther and farther apart until I discovered that my wife had been having an affair with her boss that had gone on for something like a year and a half before I discovered it. And she eventually left to be with him. 
uh, and we divorced. We had no children, which was good. Um, and by the way, I don't put all the blame on her for, for this at all, because we both played our part in creating this kind of toxic environment that we were living in. But it was still very, very painful. And so now I was at this point where I was not only disillusioned with church and religion, but also disillusioned with love. And so, like, I, I just thought, like, taking stock of my life, this was not the plan. <laughs> this was not how it was supposed to work out. But I thought, okay, fine, time for a complete reboot of my life. I was 32 at the time or something like that. Um, and I discovered internet dating. And this was back in 1999 when it was brand new um, and hardly anyone was doing it yet. But I met this cute girl. And we had some fits and starts, but I fell in love with her and I loved her deeply. And eventually we got married. We had two young daughters in 2006 and 2007, uh, just 18 months apart, which is a little bit like having twins when they're that close together. So we had a lot of parenting demands. Uh, I also took on a new job. We bought a different house and moved. Um, the stress increased quite a bit. And um, I started drinking more is a way of kind of dealing with that stress and um, and numbing myself a little bit to it. But still, everything was okay. And I felt like, all right, so the plan's gonna work. I can avoid the, the dark side of life and the shadows and the depression. I, all I have to do is follow the plan. And then the tidal wave started to hit. Um, so this was a year or so after we got married, my wife hadn't heard from her mom for a couple of days. This was right after Thanksgiving one year. And so she went to check on her mom and she actually had me on the phone with her when she was over there and my mom wasn't coming to the door and I had to kind of climb over the gate to get to the back entrance. And there she discovered her mother dead in bed, found the body there. And so what had happened is her mom had died suddenly of pneumonia and she was only 58 years old, which is not too far from what I am right now. So uh, yeah, very young and very shocking. And my wife and her sister, her only uh, sibling were really struggling with the grief, understandably. Uh, let's see, simultaneously, I had chronic back pain, which was getting much, much worse. And so I was taking daily medication for that. I was traveling a lot for work. Um, so we still had a lot going on in, in midst dealing with all the grief and funerals and those, those sorts of thing, things. And then um, uh, a year or so after that, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And he ended up passing away within a month of his diagnosis before we even got a full diagnosis or treatment plan. And uh, so he passed away and we're dealing with all of that. And then my mom began suffering with dementia pretty significantly. And so we realized, okay, we've got to get her more care. We've got to sell their house and so forth. So she ended up moving in with us. And my hope had been that it'll be some additional help because our girls were still very small at the time and she would be some additional help around the house. But no, it was actually more like taking on a third child because she needed so much care herself. So that was additional stress we were dealing with. And then not too long after that, um, my wife's sister, who had been struggling on and off with the grief about losing their mom, one very cold January day, drove her car into a pond and drowned mysteriously. And so that was a huge shock to the family. And so we were all dealing with that, kind of reeling from that shock, dealing with the funeral and all of that. And within a few weeks after that, her partner, my wife's sister's partner, hanged herself in despair over you know, the tragedy and the grief. And so there you have this long series of tragedies over just a few years that we were dealing with, and certainly my wife more than anyone, because it was her family. Uh, that she was dealing with. So she kind of spiraled into this very deep um, sadness and grief because now she had lost her mom, her sister, her sister's partner, and all she had left was her was her dad. And meanwhile, I was trying to cope with it by working too much and drinking too much, which is not, not the most healthy way to uh, deal with things and try to support your family. Um, and so my wife was dealing with the grief and then uh, we were struggling in our marriage for multitude of reasons, but the grief was certainly, you know, a significant part of that. Uh, but ultimately, my wife decided the only way that she could truly heal and rebuild her life was to do it by herself and outside of a relationship. So she decided she we had to end the marriage, and that was 
devastating to me. If I thought my first divorce was difficult, this one was a, a hundred times worse. But eventually we separated and I was battling with anger, alcohol, depression, like what the hell has happened to my life? Like this is definitely not the way it was supposed to be. Um, and so my wife moved out of the house. She found an apartment about two miles from the house we had been living in. And on the first weekend away, I got a call early on a Sunday morning and it was my wife. And I was kind of groggy. I was hungover. I'd been drinking the night before. And all I heard was two words, Jalen fell. Jalen was our oldest daughter. It was four at the time. Just those two words. Um, but I could hear my wife was, she sounded very panicked. And then the picture that appeared in my mind is like, oh, Jalen fell off the bunk bed and maybe had a broken arm or something like that. But then I heard running, I heard footsteps, I heard doors slamming. I was like, what, what, what the heck is going on? And what my wife was trying to tell me was that our oldest daughter, who was four at the time, had just fallen out of the fifth story window of my wife's new apartment. Sorry, I get emotional every time I tell the story. Um, so I sprinted to my car. I ran every single red light on those two miles uh, over to that apartment, got there just as the EMTs were loading Jalen into the ambulance and, um, uh, helicopter came and airlifted her to uh, children's hospital and I was able to ride along with them on the helicopter and um I was just praying 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 the whole time just please don't let her die God just please don't let her die and um I had this thought that maybe if one prayer doesn't work maybe a hundred will so I pulled out my phone and I typed Jalen fell from fifth story window. We're on our way to children's hospital. Please pray. And I said it to everyone that I knew. Um, and so we got to the hospital and there was a, a team of surgeons and nurses waiting. And we learned very quickly that her lungs had collapsed and were full of fluid, both lungs. She had a broken arm, uh, broken ribs, a broken pelvis that was shattered in three places and a broken right foot. And all of this was on her right side. Um, we were told that she may not survive. And even if she does, it's likely she'll have brain damage and will not walk again. Um, so we kind of settled in for the wait. So we knew we had days, weeks, months in the hospital until we, we could get to a better place, if a better place was even coming. But sometime in there, which was about the third day in the hospital, I went, I wanted to go back to the apartment because I really wanted to see it for myself. And so I went to the fifth floor and I looked out that window, which was terrifying in itself. And then I went down to the courtyard below and I looked up. And from that perspective, I felt like I could sort of understand what had happened. Um, because all of Jalen's injuries were on her right side. And in that courtyard, there was a, it was almost all cement, except for an 18 inch flower bed that was just between the cement and the edge of the building. And in that flower bed were a bunch of little scraggly bushes and one of them was smashed down. So I knew exactly where she had landed. And right next to that was this large concrete planter, which was about four feet tall and maybe three feet across. So from that perspective, I could, understand that what had happened was as she fell, her right foot caught the edge of that concrete planter and turned her body in such a way that she could land only on her right side, which spared her neck, her spinal column, her head, her brain. And she was able to land on that bush in a way that allowed her to survive. And even that in itself was, was kind of miraculous. Um, but returned to the hospital and over the next couple of days, everything just seemed to get better and better and better inexplicably. Um, it just by the day, almost by the hour, we were getting better prognosis, prognoses like constantly. And what eventually happened was we were able to go home. I was able to take her home from the hospital on the seventh day after the fall, which was also her fifth birthday. And she was still able to have the birthday party that we planned for her. And uh, 
we had been told that she may not walk again, but she walked 13 days after the fall and she went on to a complete recovery within two months. And so I tell all of that story just to, to not to, to, not to make it sound tragic, but to uh, get to the point that her survival was really what can only be called a miracle. Um, and it's a miracle I can't explain. And even at that time, I didn't want to believe that it was a miracle because I kept thinking, why would God grant me a miracle? But then I thought, well, how can it be that I was four years old and survived a near death scrape? Her accident happened at age four. That's kind of a weird coincidence. And I just had this slight inkling that maybe somehow all those prayers had worked because it wasn't just my prayer, those hundred prayers. It actually went worldwide. And there were people all over praying for this little girl. Um, so I'm uh, moving on. I'll get to the, the spiritual experience here just in one second. But I missed uh, all this. I, just, just, just. I think it's a good time here to pause because uh, sure. I know that the telling the story is uh, still heart wrenching for you, uh, especially when you realized how damaged she was, uh, and how. We're not talking about angry you were at your ex-wife for uh, letting it happen, even though we're not talking about that. Uh, there was a negligence involved, but that's the smaller part of it. That you, at age four, fell out of a moving car and should have been pretty damaged by that, and you weren't. So for some reasons that we'll never get a, our usual good answers for, um, Ken at age four and his daughter at age four had what looked like uh, near death experiences, uh, actually physical ones, but near death, and they both survived. And with that kind of background um, in your uh, history, as well as the repeated number of difficulties, of course, you saw me laughing about the plan because I knew what had happened later. The plan has worked. I married my high school sweetheart. I've got a great job. Uh, things are working. So the plan, that something was still wrong. Our marriage wasn't very good somewhere, but there's something wrong here. I did what I'm supposed to do. Can you imagine how many other people in this country now are doing what they're supposed to do and it doesn't work out? And there are other reasons why it doesn't work out. But in yours, it didn't work out and so you took a different path and now we come back to what happened uh after um your daughter's recovery and what happened with you mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's an apt point is there were this long series of of tragedies and darkness that really i felt like i was supposed to be avoiding i was doing everything i could to avoid but they just kept ha happening and so that didn't stop just because jalen survived and everything was fine with her physically um, meanwhile, I was finalizing my second divorce, which made me feel like a complete failure. I was um, trying to figure out how to be a, a single father and co-parent and so forth. And just a few months after um, bringing Jalen home from the hospital, my wife called me one night. Her dad had been in a terrible highway accident, was airlifted to the hospital and died that night. So even more grief and tragedy you know, my ex-wife now was was devastated. Now she lost everyone in her family, her her sister, her mom, and her father. Um, and so I was just struggling just to pull myself together and just keep it going just to be a good dad. And eventually, you know, it, it got better over time, but eventually I began dating again. And, uh, you know, I took a new job and, and things were sort of looking up. I eventually met this, this new woman who was amazing, very attractive, and we had a lot in common, but we we're also very different in many ways. <clears throat> and I wasn't really sure what to do with her. But meanwhile, like the depression was really creeping up. <clears throat> and I had this voice in my head that was telling me all the ways I had screwed up. And I was having occasional thoughts of suicide and so forth. And I just like, the plan didn't work. Like all this, the, these things, the, how my wife, my life was supposed to work out just didn't work. And, and I, like, I did everything right. Like, why, <laughs> why is all this pain happening? What's going wrong? What's going on? And I was in this very, very stuck place. 
And so one Sunday when I didn't have the girls, it, it was pretty hard to drag myself to church these days. But one Sunday when I didn't have them, I, I somehow dragged myself to church. I went to the contemporary service and I was listening to, he was actually my least favorite pastor speaking that morning. And he was talking about faith. And at the end of the, the sermon, right before this, the service ended, he threw in this, this sentence, just almost like an afterthought. He said, by the way, if you're struggling with your faith, why not ask for more? And so I thought, okay, I closed my eyes. And in that moment of deep despair, I just, I, I prayed a simple prayer. I was like, okay, God, I'll play along. Give me some faith. And later that week, uh, I took the girls to dinner one night. We were doing their homework at the table, came outside, and there was broken glass everywhere next to the car. Someone had broken into my car. And they had stolen my laptop, my brand new iPad that I just bought for myself a couple of days before as an early birthday present for myself, because my birthday was coming up later that week. And I was just like, what else, God? Like, what, <laughs> what else? Like, why all these shadows? Why all this pain? Um, so the next morning I, uh, took the car to get the window repaired and I had a couple hours to wait. So I was looking for a book. I had my old iPad with me. I was just looking for a book on, on Kindle. And I finally, I was looking for Stephen King or something like that, but I found this book called Proof of Heaven by Dr. Evan Alexander. And you've had him on your show. And, um, I I'd vaguely heard of it and it was about his near death experience. And I didn't really know much about NDEs or really even believe in them. I was definitely a skeptic. Um, but I started reading that story uh, over the next few days and five days later, something happened. And I suppose in a way you could call it a coincidence, but I took my iPad one day at lunch from work and I went to Boston market, which I was eating, you know, I'd go about once a week to eat there and I had a usual meal. I get my roasted chicken and my vegetables and I'd sit in a little table by the window. And so I was doing that and I was sitting there reading the part of the book where he's talking about his, his, the, what he was learning and experiencing on the other side. And he tells this beautiful story of how he's, uh, he realizes he's, he's like a speck on the, the wing of this beautiful butterfly. And he's visited by this angelic uh, woman who serves kind of as a guide to him on the other side. And she's transmitting to him these three important messages, and he kind of distills them down in the book. And the messages are, uh, you are loved and cherished, you have nothing to fear, and there is nothing you can do wrong. And so I read those, and I paused on that last one, and I read that again, there is nothing you can do wrong. And something in that message stopped my mind. It was like a Zen koan, like suddenly all my thoughts stopped. And so I put my fork down, and realized my mind was being flooded with questions at this point. So I was, I was like, what is this message of unconditional love? Like this is different than everything I'd ever believed about who God is and how the universe works and so forth. And so I finished my food, I put, threw away my trash, got my iPad, stepped out of the door of that restaurant and I stepped into it like what I can only describe as a new universe. Because outside I got hit in that parking lot, I got hit by this tidal wave of just bliss and love. And all around me, like everything was just alive with energy, colors were brighter, sounds were sharper. Um, there was like a vibrance and vibration and everything. And I could see the energy connecting the leaves on the trees and the trees with the other trees and those trees with the people who were walking in and out of the restaurant and just everything around me was just completely saturated with meaning. And I, I would just stared at everything and just like this stunned feeling of awe. Um, and um, I finally got in my car and I just sat there and I sobbed for like 10 minutes. And um, it still brings back the emotion to think of it. But, um, but when I finally was able to stop crying, I, I wiped my eyes and I stared back at the door of the restaurant. I was like, holy shit, what was in that chicken? So I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't know what had happened to me. Um, but I went back to the office that afternoon. I spent the whole afternoon just staring out the window at the trees and try, trying to think like, what just happened to me? Because there, I, I could see it like there was this perfect plan for the universe and I realized that like everything is working the way it's supposed to work and there's really nothing for us to strive for and we're all loved just the way we are and 
there was something in my in my heart that said, you knew this. You already knew this. You just forgot. Um, so for days after that, I was riding this wave of, of pure bliss. And I just knew there was, you know, everything around me was holy, even insects. And um, I couldn't look at my daughters without crying. And it was just this beautiful, amazing experience. And I finally realized, oh, wait a minute, that happened like the day before my birthday. <laughs> and so it, it was just quite a gift in that parking lot. Um, so what that whole experience did for me, um, Bernie, is just propel me on the spiritual journey that started on that day. And I started reading everything I could get my hands on, especially about consciousness. And I, I realized, so this, this might be important to, to know, or for anyone who's listening is like these experiences, I mean, they, they might be called a lot of different things. Uh, they're commonly called spiritually transformative experiences now, or STDs. They might be called a mystical experience, or a Satori, or a Kensho, or an awakening, or there's lots of different names for them. Um, but one of the things I learned was that um, people have these experiences all the time. They just don't talk about them. And so there was a, a Gallup study that came out, I think, 2002, uh, talking about spiritual experiences and in that study 41 percent of Americans said they had had a spiritual experience that changed them permanently 41 percent it's pretty significant and then if you look just at near-death experiences there's an estimate that five percent of the adult population worldwide has had an NDE I mean you do the math on that that's 400 million people and so these these kind of experiences are happening to people it's just maybe people aren't talking about them very much because they're hard to talk about and they're hard to connect with this kind of 3D reality we live in, but they're starting to show connections between people and maybe like coincidences are one of the ways that's happening. Um, but they do change people per permanently. And I can tell you from experience, like it, it makes you more loving, more open, more empathetic, more altruistic, less materialistic. And for me, it really did kick off the spiritual journey that's been going on for now 10 years. Um, and so that's kind of where I am today. Well, thanks, Ken. Uh, that's that's the story. Um, and now uh, one aspect of it that, of course, you know, I'm interested in, and you are interested, is the role of meaningful coincidences in your life now, as well as uh, the data that shows that after NDEs, which you didn't have, but something like an NDE experience, uh, people see an increase in meaningful coincidences. Synchronicity and serendipity become more part of their lives. Has that happened with you? Yeah, it absolutely has. And um, I mean, I could tell you some stories. I mean, there are some interesting things about how <clears throat> birds show up, specifically doves show up. At, at critical times in my life um and i've had some work coincidences some career coincidences that really shouldn't have happened but ended up being really serendipitous for me um so i i think what i've arrived at because i've spent a lot of time thinking about this over the last decade and trying to connect some of the dots and I think there were a couple of things that led up to my experience and then the aftermath i have definitely noticed more coincidence is happening but what I see now is well I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a little bit of a story so the way I make sense of this is like thinking about my cats we have two cats at home that I feed every night about 7 30 and they know when it's dinner time and they'll run in the kitchen and they'll sit there and wait for me to get there and then while I go in and get the canned food out they'll start meowing at me and they're running around my ankles and that, that sort of thing and I think in their minds, they think that they're making the food come. And that's not exactly what's happening. I mean, maybe, maybe they're making it come a little faster because it's kind of annoying. But um, I think that's sort of on the level of our understanding of these coincidences and these connections that are happening. So we're just barely getting an inkling of how these things come together. Um, but <clears throat> the analogy I like to think of, I used to play guitar a lot and so I kind of understand how the, the the six strings of a guitar come together and you can use different fingerings to create different chords and different harmonics and if you do that right you can make beautiful rhythm and beautiful music but I like to picture it as if 
the universe is this uh, incredibly complex, beautiful instrument. And we all have strings that we can play. But there are two critical steps there. First, you have to act and decide to play. And second, you have to tune it because that's how the music happens. So um, these coincidences seem to happen more when you start opening yourself to them and you sort of look for them. And then when then you have to act and then you have to continue working on tuning and creating that music. But I think when you do, that's when the beautiful music happens. And yeah, in, in my life, I could just only speak for me, but I've seen many, many more coincidences. Could you describe what you mean by the tuning? Well, um, I'll put it this way. So um, thinking back, and I've spent years thinking about this now since I've had that experience, but thinking back, there were two critical steps that led to that experience that kind of opened the door for me. Going back to that church service, what I did was I let go. I, I kind of recognize that I have no more power to create. I, I had the stranglehold on my life trying to, to make this plan work that wasn't working. And I finally told God, the universe, like, okay, I'm done. Like I give up, give me some faith. And so I let go. So I let go and I asked for help is what I did. So I think those were two critical steps. Um, that you, let, you let go of what? I let go of trying to control everything in my life because that's what I've been doing I was so intent on making everything work out keep my marriage together keep my family together make make everything work out according to this plan so I had to let go of that and realize I can't control all of that and that that like coming to that deep dark place of despair is what led to that I realized okay I'm done I can't do it anymore and then I asked for help and so I think those two steps were critical to me to get me to that place of opening up to an awakening. And then I, I think what you asked is like, how do you tune? So it's sort of like I had that beautiful experience and now I have to figure out how to integrate it. It's not like, it's not like you have an experience like this and everything's perfect <laughs> from then on. It's like, no, like now you get a you, you got a bunch of new information and this beautiful experience. Right. Now you got to do the work. And so that's what the tuning is. And so every day after that, I've been continuing to investigate and work on tuning my life in such a way that I can be a better human. I can have be a better father, a better husband. Uh, one of the things I did was I married that woman who was who I thought was so different from me. And we've had this amazing relationship for 10 years now. Um, and I, I, I let go of trying to control everything so much. And now I work daily on, I started meditation pro, uh, practice and um, I continue to investigate these things and just try to continue to tune my life. And that just seems to bring a lot more coincidences. Why do you think that is? Uh, I, I guess the easiest way to make sense of it is that I'm open to them now and what I realized there's this interesting balance between um, between what the universe is doing and its creative power and what we can do in our individuality. But what I was doing was trying to control everything in my individuality and make everything conform to what I wanted without giving the universe its opportunity to create the magical music that it can do. And so now what I realized is that it's this balance between the two and when you look, and you, you alluded to this earlier, it's really those two pieces. And so it's, a, it's like this beautiful dance and creating beautiful music together. You like to dance. I like music. It, you really have to have both sides of that. Um, and it's this interplay of, of the universe's power, which I feel like is coiled up behind us like this powerful spring. It's just waiting for us to act and let it do its thing. But we have to kind of control it. There's a certain amount of control we have to have, like you have to pick up the cu that coffee cup to drink some water, and mm -hmm. you have to you have to come home and feed the cats, otherwise they're going to get mad at you, uh, and more trouble. So there's certain things you have to do, but there's certain things that you have to not do, uh, and allow them to happen, and then there's some kind of a co-creation thing. Uh, which uh, coincidences can play a role in where you are tuned to their occurrence 
And by tuning to their occurrence, you're able to more act on them or with them. And I think that's what you're, I think that's something like what you're saying. Yeah, no, I think you, you, that's, yeah, you nailed it there. So it's like, I like the analogy of jazz and I've always liked jazz. And um, the, the interesting thing about jazz is there's an underlying rhythm and cadence and structure to the music, but what you have to do is improvise. And every single time a jazz piece is played, it's different and something new happens every single time. And uh, one of my favorite artists is a guy named John Coltrane, who was probably the greatest saxophone player who ever lived. Um, but he had this way of playing music without even thinking about it. And um, he literally described it as God breathing through him. And so he knew that he could create a structure where the music could come out and he could play the instrument. He had to pick up the instrument and, and work on his craft, but he let the music flow through him. And that's that's my favorite analogy, I think, of, of what we're really doing here is like we're we're letting the universe do its thing, but we're giving it a channel to do that. And it's up to us to continue to tune that channel. That John Coltrane analogy is wonderful. God breathes through me uh, and he's breathing into that saxophone. So that, that that's why it works so well as a as a metaphor. It, the breath is another very important part of just learning how to manage the tuning on this planet and one of the things that people seem to be learning is that when you really want to control things or when you're angry or there's something of tightening up of the self when you tighten that up i've got to have it this way that's a time to start breathing and relaxing because you breathe into that that pain when i got this shot in uh to get the numbing of uh this uh thing on my nose um i recognize the body responds with uh tension but the rea the best way to handle it is by relaxing and deep breathing helps relax it relax you and makes the pain much less uh, problematic and more endurable and that's true of what you're describing of wanting to control when you on the dance floor when i get to wanting to control and i've i get i've tried this a couple of times with some very subtle uh, energy experiencing other people I was dancing with if I just did a little too much um a person would kind of flit away there was something uh there was something that was too tight and managing that boundary with that other person requires picking up when the tightness happens and the breathing must then take place and I think that adds to the analogy of the music that that uh, we're we're both using as metaphor for I'm not sure how much of a metaphor really is. I think it's closer to what it actually, what what it actually is, but it's still kind of a metaphor. Oh, Ken, uh, we're coming to the end of our our time today, and uh, I'm glad to hear more detail of your story. Um, your, you and Job had a bit in common. Um, what's going on with you? with me god that you keep visiting all this stuff on me that's so difficult to handle and somehow and we'll call it faith and we'll call it faith that may have emerged to some degree in the in the in the southern new mexico desert where you grew up that there was still a a faith that you could have uh, falling out of a car at age four going into the mountaintop um that despite the programming of a fundamentalist Christian family about and America about how you're supposed to do it. You still had something else that allowed you to continue to persevere through a great deal of difficulties. And now you're becoming a spiritual teacher. And one of the best things for me that you said today, <laughs> okay, I had this spiritual transformative experience. I want to tell people about it, but that's it. it doesn't stop there you got to like keep figuring it out and that's the tuning and that's the synchronicity um idea that i'm trying to suggest one of the things that happens with people who have psychedelic treatments psilocybin for depression is they start experiencing more synchronicities uh the people who give them the psilocybin also have more synchronicities they happen but one of the problems 
I think they have is the people after they have a good experience and are less depressed, they go out into the world again and they, some of them become depressed again, but the synchronicities are potential ways for them to continue to, to build on their, on their psychedelic experience. But the, the researchers don't include them because synchronicity is still woo woo. I mean, psychedelics was woo woo for a long time and part of what you're helping me and helping us do is make uh is, no, is make synchronicities meaningful coincidence serendipities normalized that they're a part of regular reality and yeah i was on a podcast with a guy from bali that i wanted to me- to mention to you and to our audience he as we talk about the practicality of synchronicity he asked me what would the world be like if uh, everybody experienced at least one synchronicity every half hour? Now, I'm going to end my part of this with that question for you. Well, uh, I'm saying it to you so you think about it for a while. But it, it, this is the question I needed to be asked so that I could, ima- I could imagine a world that something like that is happening. So... With that comment, I ask you for a final comment, and then we'll say goodbye for today. Yeah, Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think, well, in my opinion, all of these kind of experiences exist on a spectrum. So maybe a near-death experience is on the far extreme on one end, but somewhere in the middle or or near that maybe is the spiritually transformative experience, something like what I had, but then you've got psychedelic experiences, you've got all these ways to connect with this greater reality. And I think coincidences and synchronicities also are on that. And maybe they're the most easily accessible as well. And so I would tie that into the the work that or the research I've done on the emotion of awe, because in my opinion, that awe, again, that's the closest I've come again to that feeling I had in that experience. But awe to me is like, awe is like the gateway drug to the divine. Like you can access that pretty easily. And if you open yourself to that go outside and look at the stars and think for five minutes about how small you are and um, go to an art exhibit and look at a Monet and, or go to the Grand Canyon, put yourself in nature and you've got all of these opportunities for awe that you can access instantly. And I think when you do that, you open yourself up, you kind of tune yourself to have more of those synchronicities. And I, I honestly think they're available all the time. So we could be having them every half hour if we truly tuned ourselves to it, or at least one a day, or uh, if we kind of just tune that, like open that channel, uh, clear out some of the negativity and focus on the positivity and like that feeling of awe and being connected to something bigger than yourself that you can never fully understand, then you will awaken to to some of those opportunities and you'll start on that spectrum. <laughs> you'll have more and more of those, those beautiful experiences. Um, but I'd say that's what's worked for me is that that work of continuing to tune that on a daily basis over time. And I think if people do that, just give it time and think about how you're connected to something higher and what those connections might mean in your life. And then just see what changes, because it is this beautiful dance between our creative potential and the universe's power. And I think awe, synchronicities, those kind of things, being open to those is what connects us to that. Thank you very much, Ken Bell. Uh, You've been delightful again, as usual, and hearing your stories is is wonderful. And uh, I hope your spiritual transformative experience and the tragedies that helped lead up to them will be inspiring to those of us, those who are listening to us and those who will read your book after it comes out. So thank you, Ken. Thank you so much, Dr. Coincidence. This psychosphere is our mental atmosphere, like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.